Hi, I'm here at the Castro Theater in San Francisco, and I want to talk about why the movie The Wizard of Oz still resonates with really every generation of gay man. The, the beginning of the film was shot in all of these sepia tones of brown and beige and uh, these faded colors. And it's very evocative of the Great Dust Bowl in the Midwest, uh, Kansas, where the film um, begins, and um, of the Great Depression. Uh, when I was a kid, um, this was before DVDs and um, even before VCRs, and um, they used to show um, I don't know net, what network it was, but one of the three major networks showed The Wizard of Oz every year, usually around Christmas time. And I mean, f for me, it was almost a high point of the year. And um, the question then becomes why certain particular boys like myself, why were we so attracted to the movie? One of other reasons, I think, is that stark beginning um, where Dorothy is so um, isolated and lonely and feeling persecuted. Her, her family doesn't seem to understand and her friends, um, you know, what they are. The, 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 um, the workers on the farm don't, you know, are too busy and she's sort of shuffled off. And she gets into this fantasy world of over the rainbow. And I think every young man who grew up feeling he was gay, um, different, can relate to those, the first part of the film, and that desire to um, escape and it's no accident that the rainbow and the song over the rainbow and even you know judy garland herself and dorothy as dorothy became you know icons in the gay male community and and what's so interesting you know when she opens the door when after the house is lifted up and taken to Oz, and she enters this Technicolor fantasy world. It, it's very much reminiscent, and it reminds me of what it was like to be here, to be um, in the in the Castro district of San Francisco, where the rainbow flag is everywhere, and you know, you're, there's an old movie theater that becomes like your church, where you know you can see the Wizard of Oz, and um, there's, right across the street, there's um, clubs and, and uh, discos and bars where you're accepted and um, where suddenly the past um, doesn't hurt and you're over the rainbow. But like Dorothy's journey down the yellow brick road, um, things are not the way you hoped or you imagined they would be. Um, there's, there's sort of this lurking presence always with you, and I think in the film, it's, it's the Wicked Witch of the West who just always, always reappears. But there's always this hope in some magical element, some power that's going to make everything okay. The, the wizard, the Wizard of Oz, if we could only find him. And, you know, my journey through the Castro for over a decade um, was like a journey down the yellow brick road looking for the wizard. Um, I, n I never really found him. It was sort of like Dorothy at the end you see that he's just somebody behind a curtain. And, and you know, I, I was looking for that perfection in every man I was ever with. 
and um, once it was all over, if you want to talk about the sex act, um, you, you, just, you see the truth, uh, but you don't, you don't want to see it, and you just keep hoping and hoping that it's, it's all in your imagination. What's so poignant about the film is um, that towards the end, Dorothy does realize that going home is what she always wanted. And to be home is where she wants to be and where she knows that she'll find peace and contentment. But when you're in Oz, when you're marching down the yellow brick road, you don't want to turn around and have to say, I have to go back. And, and this reminds me of a parable that our Lord, um, a parable that our Lord talked about, and that was the prodigal son. And that's very much the story of someone who is lost and hopes to find peace and happiness, but never gets it at all. Um, actually, all they find is the exact opposite. And only by turning around and going home do they, do they save their life. The, the other reason why the movie continues to resonate, I think, with so many gay men is the is the um, is really the perpetual cult around the the suffering diva, and um, Judy Garland was really the archetype of that, and really one of the first. Um, if you look back at her at her early concerts, um, there were large um, numbers of gay men that would attend, and those were really um, except. You could say like the underground um, gay bars. They were really sort of the first public events where large groups of gay men um, would gather. And, um, you know, they're very much new. I mean, to this day, gay, gay men um, can, all, can almost um, quote sort of the minutia of um, what a particular gay diva her life and what she's done and um, different different things she's said and all her movies and quotes and things um, and they were very much aware um, in the 60s of Judy Garland's um, the suffering that she had endured as a child and in Hollywood at MGM and you know all her later trials and um, that very much endeared her to, uh, to them because they could relate to that person, the misunderstood, um, um, alienated, um, suffering person. And um, you can see that in the um, continued adulation by gay men for Mar Marilyn Monroe, but also um, more recently for Princess Diana. the perfect harmony of that in The Wizard of Oz between the actress and the role where you had um, Dorothy as um, this sort of very lost and lonely girl that goes in search of um, happiness over the rainbow. And um, when Judy Garland, and of course I wasn't there, I wasn't even born, but I have read accounts when Judy Garland would sing over the rainbow at our concerts to all of these, you know, largely homosexual men, it became like a, you know, a religious experience. And you see that sort of high drama replayed by the drag queen and who are sort, who are sort of caricatures a lot of times of the old Hollywood um, female actresses.
I remember, um, because the, the Wizard of Oz is shown every year at the Castro Theater, just right, right over down the street there. Um, and, and I would go, it was, it was a high holy day. And, but I got, I got sick of it. I remember in the 90s, because they would always play over the rainbow at all of these funerals that I went to for men who had died of AIDS. And I remember one particular friend and I knew, I didn't know his family, I'd never met them, but I knew that they were, he was estranged from them. And he, he was not from San Francisco. And um, when, I remember when he died, um, and he, had, he was cremated, and there was a couple, a man and a woman with the urn, and I asked a friend, I said, who, you know, who are these people? And he said, that's their parents. And the mother, of, of course, looked devastated. The father, um, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody look that um, just racked with every sort of emotion, um, pain and um, sorrow and, and longing. And, um, and they played over the rainbow at his funeral. And I, 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 was, I didn't think of it at the time, but I remember in hindsight, I was thinking, um, because the parents took the urn home with his remains, and, you know, he came to San Francisco trying to go over the rainbow and, um, of course, was, was disappointed like so much, many of us. But he found out too late there is no place like home. And then um, um, the urn and his ashes went home with his parents. And that was, that was the end. And that was sort of the sad moral of the story. There was no place like home. Little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow.